<laughs> I just came from a table read. That's the reason why I'm late. That has nothing to do with sparkling water. Me, bro, this one, this one uh, script that I wrote like two years ago with Ken, we wanted to dust it off the shelf, get some new, breathe some new life into it. So we got readers. We did a virtual table read and uh, very interesting. I completely forgot like what even happened in the script. And we do need. Hey, wait, 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 hold the phone. Why did you revive a script from two years ago to do a table read for? So it's the one script that uh, I've written one other thing with Ken, but it is a script that we can make for cheap. And I, our memory of it is that it's strong. But we you, all right. So the reason is because you're thinking about doing a feature right it. now. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it. and that's exactly. one that you guys have gotten together and chosen. That's it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had written this like two years ago, and we just kind of forgot what it was about. And we did it, and bro, it's got some really strong bones. Like the end. What, what made you? What made you settle on that one? Uh, we have one other one that we made that's like this really weird kind of. <laughs> this is gonna be a weird pitch, bro. It's called the. Uh, it's called the hair, and it's about this like old woman who's obsessed with this like stuffed rabbit. And she's like all sexual and weird with it. That's the one that we didn't pick just because it's fucking, it's off. What brought you down to those two? Those are the only two that we finished together. Feature film scripts. Yeah. But those are the reasons. Those are the ones that you, you two have written mm -hmm. together. as features. So this one is more, could go wider. It could be more mainstream. And, uh, and it's good, man. We, I think that there is some room for improvement and that just shows we've had some growth like over the past couple of years, but for the most part, it's got the structures there. The scares are there. Um, the ending is strong. So I feel good about it. I think it's a good option. Um, why would you settle with just a screenplay that you two have written together rather than taking a short film that you guys have done that's super successful and then blowing that up into a feature length? That's an idea. Actually, this one that we read is based off of a short that did well. It's not Fisherman, okay. but I think it got like 40,000 views or something. 60. But well, I don't know. Do you think that that's important? Do you think that that would translate? Like if I were to... No, 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 no. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is something that is the best concept. Mm-hmm. All together. And I'm just connecting, you know, a successful short film with maybe that's the best conceptually. And that's why. And maybe it's worth it to do that as a feature. Um, it's possible the one that you guys did a table read on is the best concept one. I'm just I'm just trying to get an idea of where you guys are coming from. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know that uh, as far as view count goes, how much. And I don't even know if that's where you're going to. But no, I, and I didn't mean yeah. to go. Yeah. The interesting thing about the views that I've gotten on these, and we've talked about this, but like I've always been shocked. Like the ones that I put a lot, a lot, a lot of work in that I'm like, oh man, this is like, this is me, usually doesn't perform. And then the ones that I'm just like, let's just lock something together, those are the ones that do well. I mean, I personally think the best one that you have is the one where you have like the two like Ghostbuster type dudes that are like have the handy cam and they go in and then rescue the grandmother. Yeah, that's your favorite. I think that's the best one you have, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with me whatsoever. Bro, that one's so solid. I love watching that one, too. It that holds is... up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you're talking about, of one that, like, no expectations, probably. And that did fine. Yeah. It did. Better than I was well. expecting. Yeah. No. It's so funny. Um, No, yeah. So is the – so now to what you were trying to start off with before I had to, like, unpack it. Um, is the screenplay that you guys at the table read with like, are is that a pretty high concept thing that's like very, very that you're kind of you feel like you can spend a lot of time with? And then my second question is, how did the table read go as far as just a getting everyone together and b yeah, what were did you guys get some good notes from it and stuff? Yeah, man, thanks for asking. I think as far as being high concept, I don't think it's the highest concept thing. I think um, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, maybe I didn't mean high concept. High concept is more like, is it like a crazy idea? And like a lot of crazy stuff happening. I meant more like, are you proud of the concept? Like, feel like you yeah, I'm proud of the concept. It's not a when I think of like high concept, uh, I think of something like a quiet place where it's like within the title and the concept. It's something you haven't seen before that like you're. It's so obvious. Like this should have been. This should have already been a thing. Um, it's not that, but it is something that I'm really proud of. It is based on a short that did well that I, that I really like. Um, it's about like a creepy old lady, which, you know, I love, and it's really, uh, psychological. It's got, um, it blurs that line between like reality and psychological, which I love. So I think if we were to produce this, it would be a really good display of like, how I can execute a vision. I think visually and concept wise is very within my wheelhouse of what I feel like I'm good at. So I think, yeah. So I, I am excited about that. And then your second question, how it went, I thought it went great. I think our readers were awesome. I think they, uh, like they really went for it and hearing it out loud is something I've never done before. I've never had one of my scripts read out loud. It's only been like me typing away and then like short film stuff, we would just shoot it. But I think it's really valuable hearing it out loud. Have you been part of Table Reads? I have. And additionally, my dad writing this new sequel to Seven Days to Vegas, right. he has uh, different people read it out loud pretty much every time he does an edit. He like, Interesting. which I give so much credit to because... Hilariously, me and my writing partner, Dimitri, on a British... Anytime we do an edit, we would read it out loud to the other person, which, in retrospect, I'm like, dude, you have to hear someone else read it out loud and, and take things away from, like, what played, what didn't, what was tough for an actor to wrap their mind around, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, yeah, so my dad, it's, it's pretty funny, like, when he comes up with new stuff and then I read it out loud so he can gauge it um and dude table reads are my bread and butter basically in the last five six years since i've been really confident as an actor right anytime i heard table read right i know i am going to have the funnest time ever Kill it. yeah like especially yeah it's the funnest when you you're a lead part just because it's like exhausting but when you're like a smaller character or if you have mm -hmm. a lot of small roles, like sometimes they do that. They have one actor play a bunch of roles. Right. You get to like you just not off. pull out the bells and tricks but and milk it, but it's like it, an opportunity for me to see, like size it up. Like, oh, I'm a member of this whole team and I really got to like do my part to the best of the abilities and really rein it in, bring this vision to life in the best possible way. And it's an opportunity for like, yes, you're just reading with friends, but if you commit and really just like show some psych and like make it come to life in the realest possible way, people are down for it. And and granted, you read the room, you read the tone of the room and feel it out. And what's the most tasteful thing you can do in that moment? But it's like an exercise in trying to do your best when people haven't prepared much yet. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fun opportunity. Yeah, and I, and you saying this, I remember we talked about it. Like, how do you feel about actors who don't take, who don't make the most of that opportunity, who are around that table, who are just kind of stiff? They're missing out on the opportunity, right? They're kinda missing out on the opportunity. Off. And I've seen great actors already not be good in table reads. And why and do you think that is? Because they're just like, oh, it's a read, and they're not really going for it. One person I'm thinking of in particular, uh, I assume he's just not that good of a reader. Mm -hmm. So isn't that the funny thing? Like you feel like you have to be a perfect actor, but I've seen people are very talented actors that when they haven't gotten really that much time to prepare and like even memorize their lines, they're just very stiff and they, they don't get into the acting really and like playing the part. They're more just like self-conscious about reading and they get, tripped up on reading and stuff mm -hmm. um but then yeah so the the answer what i recommend for other actors and stuff too is like know yourself 
know what you have to do to become good at those table reads, even if you only have like a tiny bit to prepare. Because on the other hand, people that are really good are like, my dad's really good at table reads. My stepmom's really good at table reads because they just pros that have been around forever and that, and know that you can get fired off a table read. Really? Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, it is the chief example of, of uh how the film industry is a sales industry and you are the product and like people say oh yeah it's just a read it's not a big deal but they you know there's everyone's human and they yeah. can be susceptible to just being so nervous about their own show or something and if you you got to give yourself every chance you can get so like yeah it's a tailory but for someone else they're gonna figure out a way to stand out and if they stand out and you don't then guess what you're the one who's not rising to the bar because the bar has been raised and uh that's yeah. fascinating there's that that movie jerry Maguire. they had a yep. table read and it was with robin williams as the lead and the guy who's who's the co who's tom Hank? Tom Cruise's co-star in that. Renee his... Zellweger. No, the guy. The show me the money. Money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cuba. Cuba has this crazy story about like uh like downing like six beers in the limo that he was picked up in to like go to this read. And I'm like, shocked oh, I haven't heard this story. Yeah, and like Robin Williams. I was love there. Jamie Choir. Uh huh. Same. And Robin Williams was there, and he was reading for. And I think Robin knew that he wasn't going to get it, but he was just there for the read, which is something else to keep in mind too. It's like even someone of his caliber, he sees the players who's he sees who's directing it, who's wrote who wrote it, and he wants to be a part of it. But so Cuba shows did up. Did Robin Williams want to be a part of it, or did he pass on it? I don't know the specifics. Yeah, but I wonder. So, yeah, yeah, I mean. Robin Williams is as big as it gets. Because that would be wild. Imagine him in that role. It's kind of weird, right? Sure, he could have pulled it off. But yeah, I wonder if he was a little movie. old at that point. Well, no. Robin Williams is a brilliant dramatic actor. Dead Poet Society. Um, yeah, yeah, I got you there. But so, <laughs> so Cuba's <laughs> down in these beers, right? And he just shows up and he like does give a fuck. Like in the in a good way, like he's like I'm just gonna go crazy, and he like jumps up on the table and he's like show me the money, like he's going off. Yeah. So it's that level of commitment for a read, and that sometimes gets you the thing. I don't know, like I wish I knew all the specifics if he already had the role or if he was just reading for yeah. it, or whatever at that point. But like, yeah, you got to make the most of every opportunity. This is the most competitive industry in the world. Every and like Michael Payne said, everything's an audition. You see someone on the and. And I don't think if you think like this full time, you'll eat yourself up. But like, right, everything's an audition. Well, Life. Yeah, I mean, you'll eat yourself up. But also, even actors at the highest level, it's like, how many opportunities are you getting? Like, how many screen tests? How many auditions? How many table reads? It's kind of few and far between. One hundred percent. And um, I wanted to say, there's two things I was thinking of recently uh, on this type of stuff. I'm always especially since having a little experience now, my my sort of radar has become so much more um, connected with like these things that I find important and that when you're starting out are very important, but you don't know to look for them. For instance, uh, well, I've started watching professional table reads on YouTube. Like I saw the Game of Thrones final table read, which is a pretty famous one. And then- uh, Was that also crazy? That the mood of that- was everyone like, because the only table read I've seen, sorry to interrupt, no, the, no. Office, the finale of that and like the feeling around the table, everyone was like, it was so I, bittersweet. Same thing with Game of Thrones. Bad. Game of Thrones and Breaking Bad. And granted, those aren't the most accurate ones to watch if you're looking for actors, performance and how you should bring yourself to it because they're so complacent at that point and like having done so much. But yeah, at the same time, it's fun to honestly, like, especially if you haven't done them before, like it's very informative of like etiquette and uh like level of intensity that you should bring and stuff and and preparedness. But um 
yeah, that's definitely. And then the second thing also that I've been doing, which I've done for a long time, is like I I just found the screenplay to a movie that is awesome, The Patriot. But a lot of, some people do hate on The Patriot though a little bit, and no, it's I to bring that up. I got a sidebar. Uh, Continue. I bet. Yeah. Oh, one one second. Um, there's like so many profound moments in The Patriot that I'm like. Even if it's sort of like in a jockish bro way, like people beloved that movie. Right. There's iconic moments in that movie. I think of like a lot of those action movies, war movies of like Troy, The Patriot, Gladiator. Such great moments. And like I've been thinking about them a lot. And those screenplays aren't like talked about a lot, like out in the open. And so I got the screenplay to the Patriot and I'm just reading some of the descriptions of some of those battle things and like when the villain of that movie who's so cool and he had a big career after that Jason Isaacs how he's introduced I love that actor totally and and now he's just so like chill on Instagram and like is super big into comedy and he looks like just like a withered comedian now he never really became like a huge huge star as much as maybe he could have been but obviously he's in Harry Potter and like the he's, OA the OA which didn't do that well did it I mean, they canceled it after the second season, but it's great. Did you watch it? Yeah, I watched like one episode of it, yeah. I didn't personally get sucked in, but I think a lot of people probably did like it, and I'm sure it's very cool. Um, it sounds like you liked it. Uh, dude, like the page where they introduce Jason Isaac's character in The Patriot, I'm glad I read that description because it's freaking dope to see script to screen. And what that dialogue was like on the page and what they came up with and seeing it on the page it must have been so exciting for jason isaacs because he was a huge theater actor but he was small time and when he got that film role with mel gibson who's the biggest movie star in the world at the time and stuff and he's getting introduced as i mean can i can i read for you yeah, I have, okay, yeah. um listen to this man and it's short but okay uh all right exterior pond bluff road day a dirt road runs along the edge of the sandy swamp stretching toward green rolling hills beyond beautiful country peaceful then the ground begins to shake a thunderous sound rises louder and louder horses hooves from a from around a bend a, de a bend a detachment of cavalry gallops british green dragoons the finest light cavalry in the world Hard, strong men, excellent horsemen. Their mounts are powerful, muscled, and perfectly cared for. The dragoons themselves are all hardened veterans, marked with the blood and dirt of a recent battle. Tired, vigorous, they're armed to the teeth. Each carries a flint lock carbine, a brace of pistols, and a sword. Some carry lances as well. Regimental flags flutter. They are forty of the most. They are forty of the most imposing, frightening horsemen imaginable, and at their head. The most imposing man of all, L.T., Colonel Bannister Tarleton, the Butcher. Aristocratic, strong, dark, a powerful horseman on the best mount of the entire troop, decorated, imperious. No temper, just hard, cold authority. His men struggle to keep up with him behind them, and then they go on and on, whatever. But even that's not that revolutionary, having read it out loud. But <laughs> No, bro, you can see the whole thing. That's good writing. You can see the whole thing. Yeah, and like, yeah, you have to have a great villain. But I just love the idea of, we know in that movie, the subtext is that his little group of horsemen are like supposed to be genius. And they're the elite of the elite. But to hear them like spell that out, it's a great freaking role. You know, aristocratic, like it's bloody mm -hmm. veterans of battle. You know, it's it really sucks you in, mm -hmm. and it translated. He was brilliant. They were brilliant. An actor's feeling about the writing is how films are made, because you get that piece in there. Do we, do we talk about the Anthony Hopkins uh, talking about his role in Silence of the Lambs? Ah, uh, enlighten me. Uh please and thank you. Um, I, I'll keep it short. I'll try, but just saw a video of you know anthony hopkins and diane keaton talking about sons of the lambs and he talks about he was not the first choice for uh hannibal lecter interesting 
um, Sean Connery was. Jesus Christ. Look at that. And um, and then there's other people before that, too. I think Robert De Niro, uh, Al Pacino, people like that. And he oh. had just gone. He was a theater actor, but he did The Elephant Man. And the director, who's a beast, saw him in that, loved him. And so he ends up getting it. And he said, I think he, like, read the book or something. And he was just like, oh, I have to do it. Like, it's just... The detail and the backs, I'm sure the book's so good. And there's probably so much rich description about that character. And there's a moment that illustrates his passion for it. And I think, you know, it's one of the first scenes they're filming. And he was, by the way, starstruck of Diane Keaton at the time, who'd already won an Oscar. And she wasn't even the first choice for her character, even though she'd won the Oscar. Um, but he was starstruck. And then he... Realize, oh, I can't, you know, I got to bottle that up so that I can really play this guy who's like, th you know, threatening to her and everything. And the director goes, all right, Hopkins, we're going to see your character for the first time. And it's when um, Jodie Foster, I don't know what name I said before, but Jodie Foster is what I meant. She comes around the corner in the tunnel and first sees Hannibal Lecter. How are we going to see you? You know, you could be painting you could be because he's a genius he could be drinking wine and he goes this is this is awesome anthony hawkins says i think hannibal should be standing and waiting for her just standing there and he goes well how does how does he know how does he know she's coming and he goes he can smell her oh. he can smell her bro so that just shows the guy has such creative taste and, and how deep into the mind of that character already he knew. Fuck. And that doesn't, by the way, he's not someone that like, Oh, method acting. Like that's just comes from like, he fucking read the book and yeah. like his imagination runs wild. And that's just he's called in the circumstance. Passion. Yeah. Like a kid can do that, but that's, that's true. Creative intelligence. Wow, man. That would be a fun role to play. I think uh, right. usually like villains, like complex villains, that's a dream of actors, right? Because it's just more interesting. Well, isn't it funny though how like you just said it's a fun role to play. I rarely hear you say that. And you got burnt out of acting after acting school. And these stupid acting teachers take you the furthest place away yeah. from something like that. Whereas if I were an acting teacher... I would try to tap people into great roles at first. You know, so when I was in New York starting out, my cousin's thing, she didn't want to become an actress because in her words, she didn't want to go through therapy all the time. You think Anthony Hopkins was going through therapy with that? No, it's role playing and you're getting into exactly, what's bro. so fascinating exactly. about this other person that I have nothing to do with. And I at least think that's a good way to get, I think that's a better way to get excited about acting. Bro, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. And then, yeah, you could do the other stuff that's close to you or whatever, right? I mean, maybe, yeah. But, I, <laughs> uh, bro, I'll say, I'll say it. Like, Syracuse, like, I, I like taking personal accountability in every area of my life. Oh, However, yeah. Syracuse, that method did fuck up. Like, the, the whole, I mean, I would say that my acting was probably better before Syracuse. Most because acting stuff I've been really, saying. Totally. And, That's not limited to Syracuse that you're saying that. Yeah. 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 And when I started, I remember I had that monologue from uh from the Gladiator. Oh, you hey, know, Max, the, uh -huh, Maximus. the Maximus Aurelius thing. Yeah. Father of a murdered That's it. That's it. Unhusband of a murdered wife. I will have my revenge in this life or the next. Damn, dude. That's it. I totally forgot. Wait. And I had that because um I was stoked about it. And bro, I don't yeah. also not to like knock Shakespeare and like everything else, but like there was a lot of stuff that we did there that I just I wasn't that interested in. But going into that school, that was the monologue that I wanted. And everyone else had this like weird, obscure, like cherry. What what the fuck? Orchard. Yeah, there you go. Cherry wow. Orchard monologue. Again, not to knock the classics. Like there's definitely a place for that. But I was excited about that circumstance. You know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. Isn't it funny how they like, even in jobs at first, everyone feels like they have to make you pay your dues. They have to make it be boring and see if you want to get out the other way. 
No, dude. You're like teaching. I say get people psyched on it. Give them the freaking gladiator monologue. In, in that finally when I got in that good acting class, we would have this thing where we'd bring in a monologue. And I brought in my monologue, as you know, from the octopus teacher. I transcribed that movie, the guy talking about the octopus, how much he loved it. And I transcribed and a girl told me when I was rehearsing with her, she's like, that's the coolest monologue I've ever heard. Like, yeah. why? Why are we busy doing Shakespeare? And so, like, that's so much better. And I just think there's a place for all that other stuff that's taught classically in theater schools or in acting schools too. But like, don't bring us the shitty TV show that's casting now or this or that when you're starting out. Right. The way to hook people in is by showing them the fun, the richness it could be. But I think these teachers are morons and they don't know. 100%. I don't 100%. think they make a difference. And yeah. also where, I mean – if you took like the average of all of these teachers, these gurus, whatever at these colleges, like what is their background? Where do they come from? For the most part, they, they haven't succeeded not to knock them, but like they haven't succeeded in this profession. Probably like what, like who I don't think that's enough of a reason them? though, to hate on that. I'm going to go against the common knock on them. That's that because that they didn't make it. So they become teachers. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's it. That's because, fair. Uh, because obviously that's one way to go with it. And like a lot of people, like that is maybe the case. But I think in other industries and stuff, if you're, you know, if you're uh, successful in something, you do teach. And also like a good coach, a good coach can be someone who didn't make it as a pro soccer player. Mm -hmm. But they're still a great coach. They're a better coach than some of the pro soccer players, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So I don't. I think it comes out have of that. You found, think, though, like, have you come across yeah. a teacher? I know your coach is great that you've worked with a bunch of times. But have you had, like, a teacher in, like, a formal class that's been great as far as circumstance goes and not making it too complex with the psychology of... Remember, I told you that acting class I was in for two years, John Rosenfeld Studios. All The whole school was pretty qualified as teachers go. Mm -hmm. You're right, we've talked about that, right? A bit, Yeah. I don't remember. Just, that yeah. was before the London stuff, or where? It was after, much after. And you did that where? L.A. It was L.A. It's a bigger school. I really am blessed that I got to go because, bro, you're you're very trained. Like like London was what? Like th you're like yes yes. London was <laughs> what three years or something? Uh, it was just one year. Was one year MFA. That's why I went. Okay, so you had that year, and then you had two years in this program. No, no, no. I had one year there. Then I went to, and which was like kind of fucked me up in a lot of ways. Um, I had a great experience, like it was a life experience, great. But the acting stuff, everyone was kind of good before they got there, and I hadn't really had much experience. Got it. Um, and I didn't really feel like it was actually that hands on for me. Like I would have liked to, have been. but that being said, um. Great experience though. And then after that, moved to New York, lived there for six months, got in all these big acting classes. I did an NYU acting class. Right. They all sucked. So confusing, so jarring, just like your Syracuse stuff. They just missed the bill, bro. They're all about like, you didn't know why, you, you didn't know what you were trying to accomplish with acting too. I remember asking people like, what even is acting? Like, I literally didn't know. I was like, I was like, I was so psyched out and confused. And I'm glad you came back from that shit. Me too, man. You can go down that rabbit hole of just like, I was oh, totally fucked up. And people, you know, I was listening to everyone and not sure what I really believed because I just didn't have enough experience yet. So, and people were saying, oh, that's just how acting is. It's just confusing. And I was just like, what? What? And then, um, which I don't believe anymore. And, then uh, I moved back to L.A., got a job as an assistant on my dad's movie. And I remember being an assistant on my dad's movie, which is a comedy, but like about real stuff. And they wanted to throw me in one scene. And I remember thinking I was so scared to do even one scene. Couldn't even do it. I was And I was just going to be an extra. I was literally like, what do you do in acting? Like if there's no script, what does it really mean to be acting? And then even uh, – what was another intimidating thing? There's another example of an intimidating thing. I just, I didn't know what I didn't know. And then 
tried a couple acting classes, bro. I tried a few, and I and I faked it through a few. Mm -hmm. Like I was fine. I was always okay, able to be like natural and kind of pull off something, but I didn't know what I was doing. And then got in John Rosenfeld Studios because I was doing a comedy. I did, by the way, even I did UCB improv all the way through. Talk about being trained, you know that. Then I trained in uh, that, yeah. and I did comedy. And uh, a teacher that I met at UCB, even though I didn't like any of them until then, finally. He goes, oh, he's smart. That guy's really smart. And he's simple. And I saw him perform. And he's like a working actor. And just a normal dude. He's also a bartender. And he goes, I also teach dramatic acting at John Rosenfeld. And I was like, Sigh. I was so spent on these acting schools. I was like, I just can't do it anymore. But I ended up trying it on a whim. Mm. And I did it with my buddy. And I remember thinking, this is it. Mm. This is freaking it and the teachers weren't gurus everyone did the same material so like you had a couple different options of scenes to choose and everyone did the same stuff and so the first round it didn't matter who your scene partner was you were just getting up and performing it and then you would see other people do it and and it took the emphasis off of technique and made it about just like trying different stuff and that's what it's about doing rather than like feeling getting all heady getting all i said heady. this to you a couple of times but i had that one kid in my class at syracuse who like was like he was like dry heaving being so emotional and it wasn't related anything to do with the scene and when he finished this fucking horrendous ugly cry that we were all forced yeah. to watch for like five minutes he looked up like he just accomplished like the most incredible thing it's like bro that had nothing to do with the we couldn't even understand what he was saying what the point was and he didn't even know why he was doing it but you just yeah that's it Ed, anyway to wrap this up uh and then after you're done with the first thing the the teacher and there's usually an assistant everyone goes over the material okay what did the writer intend what's it about what did what did everyone do that was good? What well, maybe what was less good? But like the whole point of it is to make everyone the best they could possibly be. It's like super creative, fun, and then dare I say fun. And then and then the second time everyone gets to act again, second time. And this time it's stop and go. So and it's thought based. So it's like you're trying to get into the mind of the character that the the writers came up with. And if it if it's something's a little off. The teacher might be like, hey, try this thought going into it. You know, like, what do you think the character is thinking? Literally write down the thoughts. And if you are kind of off colored with it, try this thought. And then usually it changes your performance. And then even if not, yeah, they were just super simple, too. It was like the obvious stuff, like uh, layer your, your whole performance of just being sad the whole time. Now layer it with just being happy the whole time. Just try that. And then, uh, you know, it just broke the ice for a right. lot of people and yeah. I needed it. And then we started filming it. I would film all my stuff and it was just like, it was a real workshop. It was great. I was in it for two years. That's cool, man. That's really cool. I love uh, getting back to the basics of like, you want to do a scene because you're excited about the circumstance and you're able to put on this character in this circumstance. Yeah. And I want to touch on that one more time for my writers, producers, directors is like the key to this industry is getting actors excited about the circumstances that you're building because you got that the entire industry opens up to you. It like, if you have, if you have the perfect circumstance executed in a really strong way, that's all you need. That's it. So there's that. There's are endless to that. It's like, think about what are writers and directors trying to do? You're trying to find the most interesting stories to tell. Yeah. So that an audience can like what they're watching. Like it all yes. comes down to that. What a crazy. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. Jack Make interesting characters. Interesting yeah. circumstances. It's not about acting. No. That's serving a part. You know, we're, we're trying to like show something that's amazing. But the that's best actors can elevate material so well. Yeah. Like. That bro, I we we talked about the uh, the shining last time. Still, man, thinking about those facial expressions that he was making throughout the Lloyd scene and like 
the bathroom scene it's bro a great actor is is an amazing thing of course yeah it is but you know like i got i, I did the lifetime movie and on the surface you know we've seen that part a million times but like if i'm having fun mm -hmm. i'm trying to bring life to that character and finding we'll them see that stuff, like dude i i think i i got a lot to bring to the lifetime table. films coming out when like june april april bro the turnaround of that shit is fucking insane the Our shooting turn the turnaround the release like what the fuck i like it doesn't even feel it doesn't real feel quick man give us a before because we're running out i guess what uh how's the day job how's the teaching teaching's great um that's all is working great and uh and right now i'm just working on that one script that i'm stoked about uh obviously trying to drum up this old one from a couple years back, but I'm also writing something new. So having fun with that. How about you? You're doing pickleball still. Still am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm working as the assistant at this place and they're great. Uh, I also just got certified as pickleball teacher. Woo. Congrats, yeah. man. Thank That's you. Big. It's big. Uh, so, lo you know, just loving life, doing the thing. And, I don't want to blow it up, but no one can really hear this anyway. Uh, Tanner actually got a huge TV show. No way. Yeah. 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 Ooh, good for him. I know. Yeah, I know. So, is he just starting to shoot it or? He's going to shoot it in May. Okay. So that's, you know, that it's fun to see one of your own. Bro, that's huge. That's huge. And you're next, man. I mean, you're coming. This Lifetime phone comes out. Holy shit. I see it. So but no, I for real, bro. I, I really feel like it's just around the corner for both of us. Like this shit, we're rounding third base. It's coming. I think so too, man. Yeah, it's, it's quick. Bro, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, buddy. Have Thanks a great Yeah, we'll no, see you next time. Bye.